I know he's got a purpose. What is that purpose? I don't know. <laughs> we have one, though. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to share some things with you this morning and maybe put some enlightening on there. But let me start out saying this. I said, there's a design. How many know there's a design for your life? There's a design. If there's a design, then what we have what? We have a designer. I say, so basically, God is our designer. We are, the, we are designed according to him. Fashion. matter of fact, the Bible says we are created in his image. So there is a design. Because there's a designer, there's a design, there has to be a designer. How many drove the uh, church in a car this morning? How many know that car was on a drawing table someplace before, you, before it was manufactured, before you got a chance to buy it and drive it? Amen? Amen. So that car was designed for one thing. How many know you can go down, you can drive off and go into Key West International Airport, you can go down the runway and drive that car as fast as you can, and you want it to be an airplane, but guess what? It was designed to be a car. You can go, and uh, you better hit the brakes before you hit the end of the runway because you're still not going to get off the ground. Praise the Lord. On the other hand, if you took an airplane and drove down the, you know, uh, go up US-1, uh, uh, it, that's not going to be good. Uh, it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to fly over US-1, not drive up US-1. And uh, so it has a design. So there's a design as a designer. When we talk about our life, as God, God has given us uh, not only a design but a purpose. Uh, there's a design for our life because of a designer. Design implies that there's a purpose. Like I said about the car, the airplane, basically it has that purpose. Airplane's designed to fly, a car is designed to drive down the highway. So uh, that's its purpose. Uh, the purpose can be, uh, um, well, an ambulance is an automobile, so basically it can be used, set up with the right equipment to take people to the hospital. Uh, you have a car, maybe a car you came to drive with this morning. How many know it's also the family car? I know my car that uh, carried my briefcase, that carried my computer, carried all my notes and stuff to church, to come to church and give a message. That same car, I'll turn around and throw my dive gear in the back of that car, and that same car will drive me over to the dive boat where I get on my dive boat and go scuba diving. The same car. So it has different functions, but it's, it's designed to do one thing, really. It's designed to go down the highway. Praise the Lord. So it has a designer. Well, it has a purpose. The purpose is transporting uh, myself around the, around the place. Praise the Lord. So I, it has a purpose. Well, that purpose applies a destiny. The destiny of my car, of course, it, 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 the future of my car is going to be as long as it lasts. <laughs> our future is a little bit better because we're eternal beings. So our, we'll, we'll get a few more miles than our car will uh, uh, in, in our lifespan. But then what happens is destiny also requires accountability. So let me go use the car again. I guess it's a good I just took this off the top of my head this morning, but how many know? Change the oil, put gas in the car. Matter of fact, I heard a joke the other day that said this. It said, I looked up my car in Kelly Blue Book, and I was going to see what my value of my car was, and it asked me, is the tank empty or full? <laughs> I guess it makes a difference. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, I heard another one, too. It says, I got gas for $1.35 the other day. Unfortunately, it was from Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the <laughs> a des a design has a designer of purpose. Has a, okay, and you got all that right. Praise the Lord. But uh, the destiny destiny requires an accountability. So basically, if I'm going to keep my car driving, my car is going to need gas and tank. Okay, at what five dollars and something now a gallon? But uh, uh, okay, I'll vent later. Uh, and it's going to need the oil change. It's going to need tires. How many's ever going out? to get in a car that was perfectly designed and all of a sudden you have a flat tire. You're not going anywhere. Even though the car is designed for that purpose because of that flat tire, we gotta get that fixed before it can go any further or on down the highway, praise the Lord. All right, I realize that you're not gonna get your oil changed this morning, okay, or your tires are not flat, praise the Lord. So let's talk about the things of God uh, as good an illustration maybe or not. I like what, uh, I took this quote, I had this years ago, I, I was reading a book from Watchman Nee, if you've ever read that author, but he said this, he said, if the Christian life is to be pleasing to God, it must be properly adjusted to him in all things. I'll say that again, I thought that was a pretty good quote. And uh, he said, if the life of, of a Christian is to be pleasing to God, that it must be properly adjusted to him in all things. Amen. And I, I heard this quote from, from a, another place, too. It says, this is, evil things only become appealing to a people who forgot who they were. 
evil things only become appealing to a people who forgot who they were. Praise the Lord. Did you bring your Bible this morning? I'm going to open up the first scripture. I'm going to open up to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a scripture that uh, I, I've years and years I've studied this, and uh, it's it's interesting at best. It's a, but in Matthew chapter one, uh, four, uh, chapter four, verse one, it says, "In Jesus, how many know Jesus was led by the Holy, by, led up by the Spirit, and that's capital S for Spirit, it's like in Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil." The word "tempted" means to be scrutinized. If you, if you see the word, a lot of times, temptation isn't, uh, I'm going to entice the lust of your flesh. Not all, all the time in the scriptures, it's just going to be scrutinized. And so basically, Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And verse 2 says, and when he had fasted 40 days, 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. I don't know about you, I would have been hungry after the first day. But it took Jesus, I guess, 40 days to get hungry, but I would have been hungry the first day. Verse 3, it says this. This is now when he, the tempter came, he said, If you be the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. There's a question. This is the, a lot of the times, is how we answer that question is going to determine the next thing we're going to do. But basically, what God was saying, or, or Jesus was saying, he was there, he's hungry. So the devil said, well, I'm going to take and, and tempt him with a, if he really is the Son of God. Now, the, 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 the enticement here isn't the bread. Just like in the Garden of Eden, the enticement was not the forbidden fruit. It was the question God, God has said. If, let's, do fast, let's go back a, a little bit. How did Jesus come about this time? Well, 40 days ago, he'd come out of the waters of baptism. John the Baptist had baptized him. And when Jesus came up out of the waters, okay, that's another interesting thing. Why would Jesus have to be baptized if he wasn't, there was no sin in his life? Did you ever think about that? He did for us. He took the identifying role. He took the, anyway, this is the home of the, of the teaching, but he did it for us. So everything that Jesus did, everything he walked and talked, he did for us and for our benefit. So we can go back and look at these things, and we can make sense out of it for our own life. What Jesus, what, what he, what, let's go back again. So he's in the waters of baptism. John says, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Uh, I, you know, I'm, he said, no. He said, do this. He said, because it's written. So he goes ahead, and Jesus goes under the water in, in the River Jordan, comes back up. And at the time he came back up, there was this thing that came down, uh, it looked like some kind of a dove that rested upon him. And then what happens, the heavens that opened, and a voice came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was an audible voice that everybody in the area could hear. That happened before. That happened, well, not before that, but after it happened again after that, God gave an audible voice that others around them heard the audible voice but didn't recognize it. In John chapter 12, they didn't recognize it. It was, it was a thunder, thunder or it was a voice of an angel. Whatever. And Jesus said at that time, he said, this wasn't for me, this is for you. And this is, so, so in God came with thundering voice. Now here's a thundering voice from heaven. Say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He goes there 40 days later. Satan comes around 40 days uh, later and says, if you be the son of God. Was he not at the water baptism? Was he not hearing that? Of course he was. He's hearing everything that's going on. But the question was, if you are the son of God. There's no if about it. He said, turn these stones into bread. Of course, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I like that phrase because basically you think about that. We live because he speaks. Man does not live by bread alone. Well, we like bread. We like other things on the bread. <laughs> we like bread, and we like more bread, and we like other things. We like bread that comes in the form of donuts. <laughs> we like all kinds of food. But he said, man does not live by those things alone. Uh, um, so basically, he said, so <laughs> he said, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God uh, is, is life to us. So I say it this way, we, because he, he speaks, we live. Because God speaks, we get to live. Amen? So basically, well, that's not so unusual either because basically our, uh, uh, what is it? The Bible says that the oceans are held back. Now, we live on a two-by-four island in the middle of the, of the ocean, so we, we, we love it. But the oceans are held back by perpetual decree. That's a word, God's word speaking. Perpetual means never-ending. That's what holds our oceans back. Okay, I know they say they're rising, but 
we only, our, our highest point in Key West is 11 foot above sea level, and we haven't seen it go under yet. <laughs> okay, it's still there. But why? I look, I thank God every day for that word. I said, because by perpetual decree, you're holding back the oceans. Amen? Otherwise, so the oceans don't overtake the land. Praise the Lord. That's, again, his word by his word. He, everything is in the universe is being in place because of the word of God. That's what, we're, that's what we're dealing with. This is the same word. Now, hear the word personified in Jesus himself. And here comes the devil and says, if you be the son of God. Why not? It worked for Eve. You remember in the Garden of Eden, in, 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 a, in, a, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, he says, God gives this command, he says, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, this is Eve telling the devil, you shall not eat it, nor, nor shall touch it, lest you shall die. The serpent, or the devil, said to the woman, you will not surely die. Is that a direct contradiction of God's word? See, he's in the contradictions of God's word. Why? Because if he can get the contradiction across to whoever he's trying to get the, can, across to, he can change your mind about who you are. If he can change your mind about who you are, then he can change your destiny and purpose. And now you'll seek after that. People that don't know Jesus, people that don't follow the word or, or have any faith in, in, in Christ, how do they live? What determines their next move? Usually, however, they feel. Maybe there's somebody else in charge that they don't know about. Amen? But anyway, so the fact is, is so God, of course, uh, the devil comes to Jesus three times. Three times you, it, it's amazing. The devil knew the word. He says, if you be the son of God, you know, turn these loaves into bread. I mean, can the son of God do that? Yes. Was it something with the, the capability? Yes. But the capabilities of Jesus at the time was not in question. The, the identity of Jesus was in question. Not his capabilities. The prophets did miracles, but they weren't the son of God. So there was a power that could be had. But what the attack was not, was not on the abilities. The attack was on his purpose, on his destiny. And this is the attack, same thing that happens today with us. The devil's attack is not according to who you, he, he knows who God is. He's like, had a conversation. I was on a dive boat the other day, and um, there was two guys they were discussing, something about football and uh, Tom Brady and someone going back and forth. And, and, and the one guy, I know, I know all these people real good. I, I dive there almost every week, so I, I go out. I know all these guys. Divers are strange people anyway. I know I'm one of them. But, uh, the, but uh, anyway, they were talking back and forth about the power of this and the power of that. And all of a sudden, this one fellow looks at me. He says, he, and of course, you know, here I am, reverend standing there, talking about the power of all different things. He says, uh, and he says to me, he says, he says, uh, he says, uh, he says, sorry, he says, uh, uh, I believe in God. I says, great, man, you believe in God. So does the devil. You know, I knew him real good. He didn't take it as an insult and like that. We laughed about it. Says, yeah. He says, but he pondered on it. I looked at him and he pondered on it. He yeah, what do you just do? Just season that conversation with some salt. I'll get into that in a minute. Praise the Lord. But yeah, we, we think we believe in God, but so does the devil. He believes better than you do. Because he's seen him firsthand. Amen? That was Jesus standing there face to face, and the devil came to him and said, Turn these rocks into loaves of bread. He said, Man does not live by bread alone. It wasn't about him being concerned about Jesus' hunger, not at all. It was about him, Jesus, responding to the command of the evil one. Instead of the command of the Father. Remember what Jesus said? He said, the things you see me do and the things I say are from the Father. I don't do anything on my own. I do what the Father has told me. Isn't that amazing? Because a lot of times we, we, see, we see difficulties and we say, well, God's got me going through this or God has me going through this. Uh, Jesus was in a boat, in the back of a boat, sleeping. And a storm came up, hindering his forward motion of where he was supposed to go, let's say. And all of a sudden, Peter wakes him up and says, what would that be? That would be prayer. Peter wakes them up and says, it says, it says, don't you care that we perish? We're perishing here. You're sleeping. We're perishing. And he, and he stands up, and Jesus stands up, and he speaks to the storm. He says, peace, be still. Okay, if God sent the storm, didn't he just go went against what the Father had commanded? I guess God wasn't in the storm. Because when Jesus said, peace, be still, guess what happened to the storm? Then he turns to Peter and said, you little faith. He didn't say no faith. He said little faith. But wait a minute. 
we went to Jesus in prayer. We have a need. He shook him, he woke him up in prayer. But there was a time that God doesn't want to just do something for you. He wants to do something through you. This was Peter's opportunity, but Peter didn't recognize the opportunity. There's times that God wants us to do stuff for us. He'll empower us, but he wants us to do Wants, wants us to co-labor with him instead of just treating him like, oh, get me out of this jam, get me out of that jam, and, and different things like this. To so be a problem solver. We work for God. God don't work for us. Okay, well, I just thought, that, I just thought I'd drop that one in there. Amen? Understand something. When the Lord leads you into a conflict, are you ready for this? This is important information. When the Lord leads you into a conflict, it's never punishment for you. How many times have I heard that? Well, I guess God's trying to teach me something through going through this problem. All right, what's he trying to teach you? Because people that say that never seem to get the lesson. So if it was God, God's not a very good teacher if that was him. Amen? Or is it easier to say that than to believe and rise up with the power that God has given us? Understand this, when the Lord leads us into a conflict, it's never for punishment. Amen? It's always for punishment for the devil. You got to look at that. There's no contest between God and the devil. The devil isn't a lesser God. The devil isn't even in the same class. Remember what he was? He was a fallen angel. He was Lucifer, a fallen angel. So he's not even in the same class with God. But we got to understand who our Father is. Praise the Lord. And that's who we are. They're not even in the same class. So even to make a comparison of such. So here's Jesus being tempted, or he thinks he's being tempted for the flesh, but Jesus has already put down his flesh. The fact is, he said, no, man shall not live by bread alone. I'm proof. I just had 40 days without a meal. Man, will not live, man shall not live by bread alone. What keeps me alive? The word of God is keeping me alive right now. Of course, when the devil departed, we know the angel, angels can, and had administered to Jesus but the, because it was still a physical being. But the fact is, he said, no, man does not live by bread alone. He wasn't going to what he felt like in his flesh. He was going to what, the, what his real purpose was, and that was... Uh, resting in his spirit, and the devil didn't have a chance. Praise the Lord. Amen. Whenever the Lord leads us into a conflict, it's because he's already equipped us to win. Whatever problem you're going through right now, I guarantee you God has already equipped you to win that circumstance, as long as you don't forget who you are. Well, praise the Lord. I thought I'd get an enemy on that one. But, amen. The only uh, chance the enemy has is to get us to question what God says or question who we are, question our identity. The enemy will always try to attack. Put this in your notes. This is something I've always learned to experience too. The devil will always try to attack the last thing God said. Right? I've, over the, what, 32 years now, I think I've been in Key West, finishing in Key West, we have all kinds of people come through our church in different ways. Uh, thousands of them over the years. Uh, Key West is a transient place where people move in, people move out, church fills up, church empties out, back fills back up again. So over those years, I've come across all kinds of different uh, people, prayer requests, and so on and so forth. How many times a person come up to me and say, Lord, I just feel God wants me to start a business here. Great. Well, Pastor, will you pray for a business so it will prosper? Absolutely. That's, that's within our realm. Let's do, let's do that. You feel this is God... I'll, I'll agree with you and pray. Then all of a sudden they come back, you know, a couple weeks later and says, I, I don't know, I guess it wasn't God. Well, why do you say that? Uh, because I don't know, I started this business thing, it was God, and all I've seen is problems. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the part of the business, right? Yeah, that's the last thing God said to you, and that's the first thing that the devil attacks. I remember we were building, we were building Lighthouse Christian Academy next door. And uh, I had the guy to give me the vision, uh, uh, like a couple, three years before we even actually carried it out, had to f got the facility and everything else. And, and, and we had Lighthouse Christian Academy. I said it's going to be a, a Bible-based, um, you know, preschool, daycare preschool, different things like that. And I, I, uh, I left it open-ended as far as how many grades and what we're going to do. And I remember I was, I was here helping the guys work. I was actually working on the place. I have a construction background, but I working it. And I was going down to the electrical supply house just down the street here. And there was a guy working there. And he says, uh, he says uh, uh, I said, this is um, for Lighthouse Christian Academy. Oh, that's that project down the street. I said, yes, yeah, a project down the street. He says, 
uh, whoever started that? I did. <laughs> he says, and you think that's actually going to take off? I says, yeah, I think it's going to take off. He says, he says, well, let me tell you, you go through all that trouble, you'll spend all that money, and it, I tell you what, nobody, nobody will put their kids in that center. Lighthouse Christian Academy? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Well, we got the thing. I says, well, we got, right now I got a waiting list. We haven't, we're waiting for our, our, our CO, our certificate of occupancy. I says, and we, we got a waiting list right now. Well, you'll get the kids, but I'll tell you, the same guy. Well, I'll get the kids, but I'll tell you right now, you're not going to get any teachers. Now, at that point, I would thought he was prophesying, but he didn't. We got the teachers. We opened up in 80-some kids in there. We just, we just opened the thing up right up. As soon as we opened the door, it was like the kids flooded in, and I'm screening for employees and different things like that and working, working the thing. And he says, um, well, you built it, and you got the kids. This is the same guy. You built it, you got the kids, but I'll tell you right now, it's not going to last long. Well, he's gone someplace else. We're still here 23 years later. Amen. Amen. So I don't know how long it has to last before they call it a long time. But that every, everything that God has said, because I would go in prayer and this guy would refute it. And he, and she didn't know, he didn't know what I was praying. But the fact is, everything that, I, that God has said, I, and I realized something in the ministry real quick, especially in Key West. I learned something. You don't knuckle under the first problem that comes along or the devil's got your number. And you won't do anything to accomplish anything for the kingdom from there on in. Because if that's, if that's going to be your motive of, op of operating. We've got this religious idea that when we bow to God, God puts his, his grace on it. And everything, all the demons in hell are just poof, out of our way. That didn't work that way for Jesus. <laughs> Matter of fact, every time Jesus preached, he had to look around the crowd to see if somebody wanted to kill him. His own brothers one time told him, yeah, you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to spread this gospel around. They knew that if he went to Jerusalem, they'd be killed. They would be waiting for him to kill him in Jerusalem. His own brothers. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Of course, they changed later on. They shared last of a Pentecost Sunday I shared. They were all in the upper, upper room waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So they, they grew a little bit and they changed. But the fact is, if everything that we got in Christianity was simple and easy, it wouldn't be God, because God puts us here. Is a, the whole idea of being a Christian is conflict with the spiritual, not with people, with conflict with the spiritual realm. The fact that you like that you serve Christ infuriates the devil, but I'm glad that I serve somebody more powerful because I don't have to worry about his infuriation. Matter of fact, I don't even pay attention to it much anymore. Amen. All right. How are we doing so far? Praise the Lord. When the enemy asks you a question, it's always to take you into deception and eventually unbelief. A question, is, a question is always to heighten awareness of the truth to lead us to understanding revelation greater than greater faith. God questions only to lead us into an encounter. He doesn't question us to cause doubt or unbelief. So when God asks us a question, it's always for an encounter. Because let's face it, no matter what we do in life as a Christian or what we do as a believer, all of it's too big for us to handle. Every bit of it. Amen? Without God. So he's made it so we have to lean into him, listen to his voice, and serve him and go on without it. But it's amazing. As I, as I get older, as I see this, I get older, that the fact is, is it doesn't even matter anymore. I listen to what the devil says. I listen to what people say, different things. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. They, they always have all, all this. But God says, no, I want you to do that. I want you to do this. And invariably, regardless, against all, all earthly wisdom, it seems to come to pass. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I like Romans 8. One of my favorite scriptures in, 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 is Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 38. It says this. Paul writes this. I, lo I love it. I love the wording of it. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other cre uh, created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know, if you want to talk about where your position is, this is where I find my position. 
I find my position this way, that I am fully persuaded. That word in the Greek, persuaded, means to trust, have confidence, and to be confident. I am confident in this. As sure as I'm standing here this morning, I'm confident in the fact that nothing in this earth, nothing that comes against me, nothing that the devil will cook up will ever separate me from the love of God. What does that mean? Well, God just loves you all your life. No, no, no. Understand about the love of God. The love of God is encapsulizes one word, capsulizes everything that he's given us, everything that he's put before us, everything that he's called us into. It's our call, it's our purpose, it's who we are. That word love is what it means. It wraps us in this whole encasement of God's love because I have a purpose for you. I've got a destiny for you. You are, you are created by design. I had a design for you. Your personality just isn't your personality. And it wasn't created by the circumstances around you. It was created by me. Are you here? Three things. There's three honors, three levels of honor that every Christian uh, should be, uh, that every Christian has and should be awarded. Every person, number one, every person is created in the image of God. Number two, every person has, a, has, has been gifted by God to function in life with various levels um, that God has assigned to each individual. And then number three, the prophetic nature to celebrate the value of other people. In other words, God has not only given us, he said we're created, we're, we're, we're created after the designer, we're created at the image of God, so we're created after the designer. Not every person, we all know you've got giftings, even if you don't know what they are. But here's the thing. He's given us a prophetic nature that probably we're not even aware of, that we can take and look at people. And we can see good things for that person even before we see good things for ourselves. We can see them through the prophetic nature. I can see, well, this person has a person. Well, this person there, uh, they might be good with kids. This person over here might be good uh, for, for uh, other other areas and other strengths, we got music people. We got people that music. We have people do all kinds of things. No one person encapsulates all those gift things and different things that God has given. So He's designed by di design. Okay, He has designed us to come together as a body of Christ. Paul, who wrote Romans, also wrote Hebrews, said this: "Forsake not the assembling together." Why? In that assembly that he was talking about is all the awareness that we need, that God will give us the awareness of who we are and what we're supposed to accomplish in this, in this lifetime. It comes through the assembly. Because Jesus said, we're two or three gathered in his name, my spirit is in the midst of those that gather. That same spirit speaks to us and causes us to be in the purpose in, in, in what he's called us to be. So our very essence of who we are and what we are depends on his voice. Amen? And he speaks in the assemblies. He speaks in the corporate, like we're hearing right now, as well as he speaks in the, in the individual. How many have gotten some things and got some words and got in, in their individual prayer time, maybe alone in their prayer closet? Then all of a sudden they come to church, they found out they're not the only one. He's speaking to other people. And all of a sudden, there's a great encouragement that comes up because, you know, other people are going through the same thing and hearing the same kind of words. Not problems necessarily, but people, they're hearing the same words from the Lord, and it brings a great encouragement. Uh-huh. You think that's the design and purpose for it. But what happens is if we only go to church when we need encouragement or the assemblies, I'll just use the word assemblies, if we only go to the assemblies that, that Paul was talking about when we need encouragement, then what happens, that part in that is missing. And when that part that we are supposed to get missing, then what happens, it cuts off a lot of the blessings that God has designed just for us. <laughs> All right? Praise the Lord. So that's what it boils down to. So it's not just going to church to get something or I don't need church this week. I feel pretty good. Uh, we, it's not just going to church when you have problems or being in assembly. It's also to bring, give a place where we bring our gifts and our, our, our talents and the prophetic things over our life to benefit to other people. Amen? Praise the Lord. I'm glad I didn't stay in bed this morning and said God can bless me right here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I like when I heard this this week, when a preacher said this, I thought it was pretty good. The Bible is the only book where the author shows up when you read it. He made the comment. He said, I make it a practice not to read the Bible in the bathroom. <laughs> anyway, he said, but it is. 
when we open up the book, it's the only book where the author shows up. Amen. A lot of times our answers is in opening up the book. I don't open up the book, book, and then we have the book. I, okay. I'm, I'm privy to the, to the modern technology. But when we read the word, the author shows up. Praise the Lord. Jesus made this statement in Matthew chapter 5. In verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? And then it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Words of Jesus, they're in red, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Let's, let's t- break it down a bit. You, who's he talking to? And don't tell me the 12 disciples. He's talking to all of us if we're reading the book. So you, if we can point, I can point my finger at you, 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 you. Or as they say in the South, y'all. Okay? He's talking to y'all. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So y'all are the salt of the earth. Now he says salt. Now I go back to my religious days years and years ago. I was a religious church. And they used to say this, well, salt is a preservative. You put salt in, in the mix so it doesn't rot. Well, I don't want to preserve my old life. I want to get rid of it. I want the new life that Christ has. So would I use salt as a preservative? Now, there's a truth in that, but it's a secondary truth because Jesus didn't use that analogy. He said this specifically, you are salt of the earth, but a salt loses its flavor. Now, you've got different, I mean, what do they call that? Condiments on the table. If you go in a restaurant, you have condiments. What are condiments? Ketchup. Mustard, you know, all different other things put on the table. And it's, it's frequently used by people. Did you ever see a guy sit down and get this nice, thick, juicy T-bone steak? Then he covers it with ketchup. <laughs> I want to reach across the table and slap him, but I can't be a striker. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Ruining that nice piece of meat with ketchup? Ketchup? Ketchup was designed for food that tastes bad to help get it, make it palatable. That's what the, the Heinz did when he made ketchup. But ketchup or barbecue sauce. But why? Jesus isn't saying, don't change the flavor of the meal. He's saying, enhance it. But you would take a nice thick, juicy steak and you don't ruin it at all by putting a little salt on it. Amen? But here's what happens in, 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 in Christian circles. We want the salt. We got the salt. Yeah, we're the salt. Pastor, yeah, we're the salt. Amen. We're salt. Hallelujah. We got it. We're salt. Then we take the salt shaker, we open up the, and we just dump it in the corner of the plate. We don't spread it around. Why? Because we like to be together. We like to hang out together because we're all the same. He says, the salt loses its flavor loses its ability. In other words, to be sprinkled across the whole meat. It's interesting, those four words, salt loses its flavor. That is one word in the Greek, which has been translated, salt, when salt loses its flavor. But what is translated in the Greek, you know the one Greek word that means? It means foolish. But when we are foolish, we are good for nothing. How Shall it be seasoned it is then good for nothing, this is what Jesus said, but is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. When we're foolish about our purpose, when we're foolish about what we're called to do, when we're foolish about the things of God, he said they'd be trampled underfoot by men. He specifically said trampled underfoot. What does that mean? In, in, in ancient times, to be underfoot was a lesser. So the greater that you have been given by God, the greater call now becomes a lesser because underfoot. I'll give you an example. When they have a battle in ancient times, the winner of the battle would bring forth the leader of the, of the opposing uh, uh, tribe or opposing army. They would bring him forth. They would make the general of that army kneel down And then the victor would take his foot and place it on his head. This is what Jesus said when he said, the devil's under your foot. In other words, I just defeated you. You're the loser. 
Now he says the salt that we're supposed to be, you are the salt of the earth. As long as we're right here, not salt of heaven, salt of the earth. He said, but when we lose our saviorness, when we lose our flavor, he says, we become the losers and we're trampled underfoot. He got my attention. How many know salt without flavor is foolishness? That's what the, I just gave you. But. So then salt with flavor must be? Who said wisdom? Give that man a 50-cent piece. It's absolutely correct. Wisdom. Because the opposite of foolishness, when God would be wise, Jesus is the personification of all wisdom. When we, go to, when we need wisdom, what does God say? Go to him and ask him. He gives liberally. In other words, he pours that salt all over us. Hallelujah. Wisdom, wisdom, and more wisdom. Your whole life will be better with it when you follow it. Praise the Lord. Wisdom. Wisdom is the mind of Christ. We are designed by God to add flavor to a conversation. When he was talking about salt of the earth, what does that mean? It doesn't mean just your existence. It can mean that sometimes. Amen? Amen. I mean, what, I was sitting there listening to that conversation on a dive boat, and, and, and the, the, the guy I know, he says, he says oh, oh, sorry, he said, I believe in God, too. I said, yeah, well, so does the devil. <laughs> but he said, oh, yeah, yeah, and he pondered it for him. Nobody got mad or anything. I, thought, I didn't insult him or anything like that. What did I just do? I just seasoned that conversation he was having with salt. So this is something to think about. I'm glad somebody did that to me years ago. Amen. I was under the impression I was saved. I went to church all my life. My mother drug me by my ear. She going to take me to church. I turned 18. I left the house. I walked out of the house. I told my mother. She said, right there, 94. She can talk to her. I said, I said, I said, I said that's it. I said, I am out, done with this thing. I am done with church. You will never find me in church again. You see how that worked out? <laughs> yeah, God laughed too, just like you did, huh? <laughs> he had no idea. Praise the Lord. In Colossians 4, Paul writes this, Colossians 4, verse 6, it says, he said, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. So we know he's talking about conversation. There's proof right there. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Good saltness how to give an answer. Amen? Yeah, the devil knows God too. What's your point? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Right, verses, right the next verses down, God also says this. He says this. In Matthew 5, verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. So we got two things. We got salt and we got light. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. When is a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. When is it, what's the conditions have to be so the city can be seen far away sitting on a hill? It cannot be hidden. What are the conditions around it? I got news for you. Total darkness. When total darkness is around that city, when the city is lift up on a hill and total darkness is around that is when it shines the brightest. What do you call, what would you call, how would you put a spiritual connotation to that? So when we're surrounded by total darkness, things may not be always going our way. Things may not be having you know, an easy trip at the thing. But all of a sudden, that light begins to shine. And how we stand there, illuminated to everybody else. Now, he said city. He could have said lamp. He could have said torch. He could have said bonfire. He could have said a lot of things that would still implement the same, the same idea as separating darkness. But he didn't. He said city. Why did he say city? I wanted to know that. Why did Jesus use the word city instead of lamp? He used it lamp other places in the scripture. Why didn't he use lamp? Why a city? Because lamp, you know, we're just little lamps and we just have the Holy Ghost and we're just flickering a little light just sitting there. And people see it and they're drawn to our light. Well, so are moths and insects. No, he said city. Why? Inside that city is what others need. If you're out into a wilderness, a darkness, and all of a sudden you need a meal, you're going to go to the city that you can see. All of a sudden you need fellowship, you're going to go to the city. It's the one place in the Bible that doesn't move. It doesn't go to you, fathead. It come, you have to go to it. That's 
Not derogatory towards anybody, hallelujah. <laughs> Unless you really are a bad leader. No, anyway, praise the Lord. Amen? No, it's the one place, it's the one thing Jesus said, no, you have to walk, actually go to it. Well, we're a city set on a hill. You're not going to douse our light for nothing. I pray that every morning. We're a light in Key West. We're shining, shining, shining. I'm 32 years I've been praying. No, we're shining. I refuse to bow to the knee, bow a knee to the gods of this city. I refuse. Amen. No, Christ has destined me for greater than that. Amen. Why would I give up? Why would I give in? Praise the, praise the Lord. But we stand, and for 32 years, we've stood in this island just, just that way. No, I stand. And when you've done all the stand, stand therefore, Paul says in Ephesians, where your loins gird about with the truth. As long as you're girded about with the truth and the armor of God, stand. And when you've done all the stand, what does he say? Stand some more. When you think you've stretched out your limit of standing, we keep on standing and we stand more. And we keep on doing it again and we do it again. What happens if it don't work, Pastor? We're going to do it again. What happens if this is going to fail? Then we'll get up and we'll do it again. What happens, Pastor, if they take our building, we'll stand in the street corner? What happens if they arrest us from the street corner? We'll have a jail ministry. There's a determination that should be in every Christian's DNA, a determination. I will not give in to whatever Satan wants. I don't care how pleasurable it seems or easy it seems at the time. I will not give in. And boy, when you've done that, God has your, you have God's attention of the Father right there. He said, that's my son. That's my boy. I remember my, 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 my son, Eric, when he was playing t-ball. Oh, they were terrible. But his team went undefeated. He only went undefeated because the other teams didn't even know what a ball was. <laughs> you know, a T-ball, they're all little kids. I forget how old it was. What was this, like six, nine? I know, he just, anyway, he was just, uh, and they get up there and they hit T-ball. And he'd run, he'd run his heart out. And he was the Astros. They had little orange shirts on. He was the Astros. And he was so proud of himself. And I, he'd do something. And, he, and you could see him out there. He's just proud because he did something right. And I'd say, whose son is that? Hallelujah. Whose son is that? I, th I could just see the father stand up at the throne and say, Jess, whose son is that? Whose daughter is that? Stand when you've done all the stand. Therefore, because you're not because of your own stubbornness, what it might appear to, but because God has told you this is what it's going to be, and you stand no matter what to see that it comes to pass. I'm going to do everything I can to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and cooperate with God. Help anybody this morning? The city of Hill cannot be hidden, nor, there they, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now he's using the lampstand. Then he says, in you know, the lampstand, it gives light to the whole house. Let your light shine before you. What's he doing? He's saying, first the city, now bring it at home. First the city, then at home. Not only look at the big things, the big, big visions, in Key West, we're looking at taking the city. From here, I got on an airplane. I've preached in five different continents around the world. It doesn't matter. When we come back, back down here, I have to go home like you have to go home, and I have to be the same in my home. When sickness and disease comes, Diane and I get together, we pray. We'll sit and have communion. When things go, aren't going well, we'll sit and have, we'll, we'll just encourage each other. But we're standing to stand, and when we've done all the stand, we'll stand more, and so we'll stand some more, and we'll stand some more. Running away is not standing. Hallelujah. Isaiah 60 and verse 1. This is one of my favorite scriptures too. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness. Deep darkness is mental depression. Mental depression could be upon the people. But the Lord will arise, will arise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you, and the Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to your brightness of your rising. Yeah, we're not doing that. We're just standing out here. Stand out there and shine. So two things got Jesus was saying. He said, he said, be salt, and he said, be light. Salt and light. He actually mentioned three things. I don't know if I got time for it. Yeah, I got, I got five minutes. Praise the Lord. How many of you know Jesus talked about something else? He talked about leaven. I taught on it before, so this is kind of a repeat. We have three leavens that are mentioned in the Bible. One is the leaven of Herod, 
to the leaven of the Pharisees, which is religious. Herod would be political leaven. Leaven of Pharisees would be religious. And then the, the second one is a leaven of the kingdom or God's domain. What happens with leaven is it's put into, it's, it's, I don't know, I'm not a cook, but this is what they tell me. Uh, uh, Sarai cooks and my wife cooks and some of the other ladies cook, but you put uh, the leaven or yeast into the lump of dough, correct? What you want to do to get that to rise, you, the leaven makes it to rise, and then what happens, the dough rises, then you put it in the oven. Is that correct? Okay, I'm not, a, I'm not a cook or a chef, so you can correct me. But then it becomes bread when it's, when it's cooked at the right temperature. Okay. If the bread is slow to rise, you need a heat source. And when you put it towards a heat source, it activates the leaven, and it rises up. How many ever rose up in here? Praise the Lord. All right. But anyway, it rises up. So what happens is you have three possibilities of leaven. If you have the leaven of the Herod, which is a political arena, you have the leaven of the Pharisees, which is religious. I mean, we, we, we battle that in this city. Hallelujah. Okay, religious. And we have the leaven of the kingdom, which is God's domain. We'll just turn up the heat a little bit when the heat of trouble comes in. What happens? And the heat of trouble is applied. Which one rises within us? And when God will reveal the leaven that doesn't belong from the leaven that does. So leaven itself is not wrong, but is it the leaven of Herod or is it the leaven of the Pharisees? So we can boil it down. A leaven really is a mindset. And when the heat of trouble comes, what's the first thing that rises? This is a better message I'm getting response to this morning, but that's okay. I'm not, I'm not daunted in the least. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Last scripture. Along the same line. You got me now? Okay. Last scripture. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says this. Therefore, let him, therefore, by him, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. How many have ever read that scripture? So our praise, we come in this morning, we've been in a, our praise becomes a sacrifice to him, right? I'll tell you what a sacrifice is in a minute. Uh, uh, offer a sacrifice unto God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks. But listen to verse 16. But do not forget to do and to share, for with such sacrifices, now he uses the plural, sacrifices, God is well pleased. And I looked at that word share. What he's saying, he says, fellowship is a sacrifice. Praise, good works, fellowship, those are the sacrifices. Okay, so praise, good works, fellowships is a sacrifice that pleases God. You got me? We have last Sunday of the month, we have fellowship. We, we go over and we eat <laughs> over in the Lighthouse Christian County side. And we go there and we eat. We have, we have fellowship. Well, understand what a sacrifice is. Fellowship, let me use that for an example, as a sacrifice is a step beyond convenience. Sacrifice is a step beyond convenience. How many are looking for, for convenience? Well, it might have been convenient to come to church this morning. It may not have been convenient to come this morning. It doesn't matter. Sacrifice pleases God. It's a step beyond our convenience. Hmm. All right, it's getting quiet in this Presbyterian convention. Are we here this morning? Praise him. I heard this phrase. This isn't mine. I heard this phrase. I thought it was pretty good. I jotted down my notes. I just heard this. I started thinking about it. The disciples belonged. I'm still on that thing about the city on a hill and, and, and their fellowships, the whole thing. The, the disciples belonged before they believed. That seemed to be a, an, an obscure statement. The disciples, talking about the 12 disciples that followed Jesus, the disciples belonged before they believed. In other words, they followed Jesus without even knowing who he was. Okay, case in point. Uh, Matthew, tax collector, um, come follow me. Okay. Peter. Put down the nets. I'll make you a fisher of men. Oh, okay. 
It was later on in Jesus' ministry, he said this, he made this question, he said, who do men say that I am? They all looked at each other. Oh, well, some say you're the Baptist, some say this, some say that. He said, oh, who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up, he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said this, he says, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but that's come from the Father. They belonged before they even believed who he was. Amen? Church can learn a lesson. They can belong way before they can believe. Help anybody this morning? Amen. That's a good message. How many, how many have a purpose? Anybody here doubt their purpose? You weren't listening. <laughs> there is nobody. Praise the Lord. Let's stand at our feet. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father God, that I thank you for the for the group that we have here this morning, that Lord, they did they didn't do what was convenient, but they took the step beyond convenience. And I thank you, Father God, for people that are rising up all over today that are taking a step of inconvenience. Okay, just just to to be with you, just to be in your presence. There's taking the steps that aren't convenient. Uh, that, that maybe it takes a little bit of work to get to do something. But, Father, you were in a season right now. I sense we're in a season and a training, Father God, that you're putting your church through to prepare us, Father God, so we can become more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray that spirit. Now, we sang that song this morning about breakthrough. I pray breakthrough like we have never seen before. Now, I said that. I believe that's God. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Don't think it's easy street. Amen? But understand this. God has already equipped you. He has already equipped you to have victory over the devil. Amen? How many are glad for the victory? Well, then get glad for the battle because you can't have one without the other. <laughs> if you're going to have a victory, you're going to be a fight. There's going to be a struggle. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Bless the people to hear your word this morning. And Lord, let it go from the, from the head to the heart. Let us, Father God, be words that we can walk by. And I want everybody to, let, to leave this session right now in the name of Jesus, knowing who we are in Christ. We are your people. Father God, we are called after your name in the name of Jesus. We stand by that no matter what. We stand by that. We are your people, called according to your purpose in Jesus' name. We put that first in the name of Jesus. You put that first, you won't have to worry about making a living. God, God will see to it. You in, you're in a position. It's amazing. I don't have time to teach this, but I remember Elijah. Elijah called forth a drought. Oh, we hit a drought, all right. I mean, it, the whole land was drier than cracker juice. I mean, it was it. And what did he tell Elijah? He says, go east. For Elijah to get, his per, to get his provisions, he had to be exactly where God told him. If he'd gone west, he would have died with the rest of them. But what was east? There was a wadi. In, in Israel, they call them wadis. They're, they're, they're a stream that flows, but they don't flow all year long. And it, when it's dry, it's dry wadi. And then, of course, when the rainy season comes, the, the, uh, the Valley of Allah, where D David faced off with Goliath, that was a wadi. I went there. It was very cool. Uh, and, and two mountains on either side, and the stream comes down the middle. There was no water. In I was picking up rocks and saying, man, that looks like a rock to kill a giant. Anyway, just look at it, do some things like that. But, amen. So what happened is it lasted for a while, but then it dried up. So he says, I got this other woman. She's going to take care of you. She didn't have nothing. God led him to a place, to a woman, that he says, we're going to take care of all his needs, his foods and stuff like that. And she didn't have anything. So she had depending on the miracle, and the two of them together believed in God, and God supplied the miracle. Why? Because it wasn't by the hand of the prophet without, without the Lord. Amen? Until finally God put upon his heart to pray that the drought ends. Remember how that prayer went? Seven times. And he, says, and he sent his servant out there. I don't see no clouds. 
Prayed again. I don't see no clouds. Kept praying. I prayed again. Then we said, oh, I don't see still don't see no clouds. Oh, wait a minute. Seventh time he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. A lot of times God will start something in your life that will only be a cloud the size of a hand. What you look at is nothing. Well, that's nothing. No, it's God's provision. If it's got this cloud the size of a man's hand, go after it. It's God's word being answered. Help anybody this morning? Father, we give you praise. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, everybody in this church said... Amen.